Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Or good afternoon, I should say, for <laughs> wonderful people that join us from the UK. Let's see here. We are. There's some familiar faces. So I just want to. We okay, have still a little bit more people popping in here. Okay. Good morning. We have, oh, we have some people from Switzerland as well. Good morning, Stephanie. Or good afternoon, I should say. Sorry. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hi. Hey. Yeah, good evening already. It's dark here. Yes, yeah. yeah, I. <laughs> so, uh, uh, why don't you all uh, uh, drop in the chat real quick where you're joining us from? Um, so my name is Christian Wanderer. In case you haven't met me, I'm the founder of the Semco Style Institute in the U.S. And I'm very, very pleased to welcome Perry Timms today to join us. He's the founder and chief energy officer of PTHR. And he's also a Semco Style expert. And uh, he, he's a man of many talents, right? He has a, the deep expertise in HR, the future of work and also in simple style, but a, a, a venue that is particularly on, on cutting edge is his thoughts and research around a decentralized autonomous organization or DAOs and to think about beyond the blockchain. So that's the goal for today for us to hear a little bit more about the, the blockchain and how this can impact organizations right, decentralized uh, um, autonomous organizations and what the potential is for, for this, particularly in regards to the future of work. And maybe just in a nutshell, real quick, for people that are new to the Semco Style Institute, we are a, a network internationally, globally, of uh, consultants and practitioners who are either external to organizations to help them uh, co-create uh, appropriate designs for organizations and coach people how to work in new ways, in ways that are more human-centered. And we have, so we have external consultants, but we also have internal consultants, people that advise organizations from the inside on how to recreate their uh, workplace and how to tap into the human potential. The Semco style is based on the, a company called Semco out of Brazil that has done really revolutionary work in the 80s and 90s, right? Where they decentralized the way they would work. They basically flipped a, a traditional hierarchy into a more participative organization and then ultimately in a network of different companies, right? And so that's why the decentralized autonomous organization, that, that idea behind that, really uh, works well with the mindset and the practices that uh, Semco has already uh, uh, you know, developed and practiced uh, over 20 years ago. So with, with that being said, I'm really excited to learn more from you, Terry, and also maybe uh, Perry, and also learn more from people in the audience of what does the blockchain have to do with this and what are maybe some ways that we can leverage the blockchain to further uh, create organizations that are human-centered and that are also, uh, you know, cutting edge. Thank you for that, Christian. Thank you. Yeah. And similar to you, um, you know, my kind of journey into the whole self-managed world of um, operating systems in work uh, started with the book Maverick. And, and, and it was almost like, wow, this really exists. I just kind of thought it was me who didn't like authoritarian and micromanaging. And it wasn't. It was a liberating force. So since then, I've been on a trail of like just trying to assemble as much as I can about this kind of new shift towards more autonomy. Um, so it might feel a bit odd that we're talking about human-centered systems and now we're dialing into uh, web3 blockchain and decentralized autonomous organizations and cryptocurrency but i think what i'm really fascinated in is the fact that my kind of working life has um, uh, evolved around technology and i've been lucky enough to work on projects where i've seen so many different iterations of mainframes into desktop computing and internet services and now of course we're talking about vr ar web3 and all sorts of things i'm still fascinated by it it's a sort of manifestation and an external 
internalization, I guess, of some of our wishes, hopes, aspirations. And of course, it then turns back on ourselves and becomes fear and trepidation and all sorts of other things. Um, but yeah, I am really interested in this concept of an organization that exists that's not really an organization and it has all sorts of parameters and interactions and and facets that we would know from our kind of analog human systems but they're encoded and they're encrypted and they're utilized in a technological sense now before i dive into it i i am not a technologist i tried um coding a few years ago i just didn't really like it i just didn't really get it it's like it's not really for me um but i absolutely respect the engineering and the design and the, and the kind of throughput that, that that creates so i would say i'm still an observer and a user of technology have i stepped into blockchain and really understood it and been part of a doubt no but am i picking up signals am i looking at where it's been deployed am i curious about what that might mean for the way we create and build i suppose trust decision making um, certainty and all that yes i really am so that's where i'm going to come from uh, with this so uh, thanks for that um, intro uh, christian and great to spend some time with you all so yeah um uh, a tiny little bit about me yes hr is kind of like my domain but i'm one of those people who um, refuses to just be a policy creator i absolutely see the power in understanding people and psychology and organization design and systems thinking and all those things combine for us to get some control back from the machinery of work that has just got us to this semi post industrial confusion i suppose um so yeah i i sit in that kind of space within um, hr but very proud to be part of semco um, uh, institute um uh, and what it stands for and, and where it might go uh, for us um so um a tiny little bit about us i like to collect logos uh, as an organization we are a certified b corporation we are climate positive we work a four-day week now normally I don't work today, but we have this mantra in our little enterprise that if you do have to work on a Wednesday, you have to do something that's good for the soul. And this is good for the soul. So that's why I'm here. So, yeah, so we we want to stand in the space of companies who go beyond, um, you know, kind of transactional and really um, live a purpose and really strongly uh, represent um, good in organisations. But as I said earlier, people power change, designing systems, thinking energy is really important to us. And we very much believe in the fact that those UN sustainable development goals are there for a reason. So we're trying to do all we can uh, to help deliver some of those. Um, but enough of that. Let's get into DAOs. Um, I don't know if you've ever come across the concept of a decentralised autonomous organisation, but I suppose there is a, a sort of a frame of reference to think about here in that no organisation exists without human beings um, interacting in some shape or form or creating it or, or, or creating the value that's within it. But perhaps DAOs are the nearest attempt that we could get to where a lot of the sort of heavy lifting and perhaps even sort of um, biases that human beings have that distort a working proposition uh, are trying to be coded into a technology arena that, that that gives us a different option for how we make decisions how we create trusted transactions and how we interact with each other so a DAO 101 if there is such a thing it is a part of the web 3 kind of um, movement i suppose so within that we're talking about stuff that's beyond internet technology which was web 2 um, uh, uh, and the social interactions the fact we could write and blog our way into existence and find our own little corner of the web and Web 1, of course, was where it was all about commercial enterprises who had websites and it was a kind of one way traffic type thing. Web 3 is much more about the reclaim, I suppose, of the infrastructure and the, and the nature of what the web can do for us, uh, not necessarily that we are at its behest. Um, it does feel sometimes like we do have new forms of addiction that are largely centred around web traffic and time online and so on. Um, now, the blockchain was something that that emerged and interested me because of the sort of promise, I suppose, of a, a new form of technology that wasn't this centralised, hosted by large conglomerate organisations and therefore the control around it, the access and privilege is around it, uh, were, were, were dispersed. It was a form of technology that connected 
in blocks that were almost constantly moving. So it wasn't a case of somebody owned all the data that we have. I don't know if you remember the Bruce Willis case against Apple and iTunes, where he said, look, that's all my music. When I die, I want to leave it and pass it on. But like you're telling me you own it. It's like, no, you don't. I own it. I bought it from you. and <laughs> I copied CDs into it. And it's that kind of intellectual wrangling, I suppose, that the blockchain is aiming to go. We're not having any of that. We're not having any of this conglomerate industrial giant ownerships we're going to create an open free infrastructure that is safe secure and can be used for automated transactions and trusted interactions so uh, it's not a lesson in the blockchain but i guess we've kind of got to touch on it a, a tiny bit now within that you might have heard of bitcoin and you might have heard of Ethereum and you might have heard of some of the other Dogecoin, all sorts of other variables on token exchange and, 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 and like a currency uh, value that has been built off the back of the blockchain. And people are kind of going, but, but is it real money? <laughs> it's like, well, there is a conversion mechanism for it. I remember walking into a hotel in Slovenia and next door to it was a bank. And in there was a cash dispenser that if you had... Um, bitcoins you could actually withdraw euros against it and it's like wow i just feel like i've stepped into the future um now of course recent uh headline news has um you know the fsk scandal of um almost corruption i suppose going on within that system and we we kind of go ah see look blockchain and cryptocurrencies is all flawed uh, like the current economic system isn't, <laughs> like the current economic system cannot be gamed and distorted and so on. So I guess we're used to an imperfect system and perhaps the cryptocurrency token world is still in its infancy and still imperfect. And I'll give you an example of where that comes from. But the attempt here is to create a different form of value exchange outside of the control of nationally owned banking institutions. You know, those ones who get our money when they sell rubbish products and go um, kaput. Uh, it's an attempt to create a different kind of infrastructure around that. And there are some concerns about, I guess, the validity and the long term uh, trajectory of this. But people who had a Bitcoin five years ago uh, have probably found that that's increased in its market value quite significantly. I've got some statistics later to talk to you about the value in a kind of comparable sense um, of where people are with this. So it's a fascinating area. Um, the whole concept of money is fascinating. I mean, it's not real, is it? I mean, we rarely even use physical notes or coins that you could argue have got some kind of value, but really they're IOUs. They are, I've got something from you. Uh, you need something from me. I'll give you this token that you can then pass on to other people. It's an IOU. All money is an IOU, really. So it's a kind of an odd thing. So I guess we've got crypto IOUs now. Now, the difference with DAOs and some other forms of um, blockchain and I guess you'd say sort of crypto trading is that this is an attempt to automate a number of transactions and exchanges and information um, uh, uh, sort of dispersal, I suppose, that organisations themselves normally do through human beings, coded, immediate trusted robust reliable coding sits behind automated things like smart contracts where people agree certain terms um, input that into a computer system that then creates an, an indelible entry that says this is the legal agreement that you've just stepped into and i'll come on to legal in a moment because you can see the word illegal and a question mark there so smart contracts is one example where people say um, what we're going to do is commit to something and we will get the technology to kind of own the agreement so that you and I know exactly what it is. And we don't, you know, tip X out uh, some details and pretend that never existed. We've got this indelible proof of what we agreed at a particular moment in time. So it's trying to take some of the fraudulent practice and so on away from human beings who can corrupt agreements and, and, and so on. They are venture capital like DAOs. So often where we're seeing DAOs now occupy space, it's in people who have a proposition that needs some funding. They haven't got them themselves. They're looking for people to invest in them in a very specific way so they can get a venture off the ground. And a DAO is a way of creating almost like a communal funding mechanism, like Kickstarter, I suppose you'd say. And so people might go, well, why don't you just use Kickstarter? Well, A, it's crowded. B, uh, there's probably different levels of security and privilege and maybe even fraudulent opportunities within that. 
But the idea behind a DAO is that it's a validated community who are, I guess you'd say, not invested in anything other than the fact that they've got their own tokens and you can bid to them, not as a massive conglomerate like uh, Sequoia uh, and the other funders out in Silicon Valley, but as individuals who have some value that they are willing to invest in you to then perhaps realise uh, and see an opportunity and may, maybe even make even more uh, kind of currency out of that. So they are very VC-like and voting is often uh, part of it. So you will see, as I start to illuminate what DAOs might have, that this sense of democratic and um, perhaps even meritocratic um, input is part of the DAO kind of construct and constitution. So again, it's not like there's a CEO of a DAO. That just doesn't exist. There are people with different levels of voting right and privilege, depending on the nature of the investment they are putting into a potential um, a bid or pitch or, or solution. So um, uh, is it another form of hierarchy? Um, kind of, but kind of not. There are conditions and frames that are given to people who can create inputs based on um, potential investment. So that kind of voting mechanism comes into play there. If I've got more crypto than somebody else, I can probably have a slightly stronger weighted um, impact on the outcome because I will, will back it a bit like Dragon's Den or Shark Tank. Some people will vote and with their own money and put a lot into it and others might split that across a couple of, uh, um, uh, of those kind of business leaders. However, some uh, states, particularly in the US, and some uh, uh, constitutional bodies have deemed them illegal. They are deeming DAOs as, to, as something that's kind of outside the law, above the law, beyond the law, partly because the law hasn't really gra grappled with the nature of how traditional legalities and patents and so on apply in an environment which is incredibly detached from all of those kind of precedents and rules and regulations. Others have taken a different approach and said, actually, we'll kind of embrace it and bring it into the fold, recognising it's different. We won't make it illegal. We will create a different form of regulatory overarch, I suppose, for that kind of thing. But early signs are people are a bit frightened by DAOs. They don't know what to do with them from a governmental intellectual property ownership kind of perspective because it's incredibly different. Are they safe? <laughs> You'll see an example soon where initially, perhaps not. Uh, they're getting safer with the advent of, I guess you'd say, technological advancement and, and regulatory um, uh, sort of uh, elements coming into the DAO arena with smart contracts and automation and coding. But at the moment, it's a bit Wild West. They are quite literally new frontier, pioneering, that kind of thing. And with it, there's bound to be risk and bound to be some things that aren't quite as um, sort of robust, perhaps, as people might have thought they were. Are they replicable? That's another concern people have. Is it something that could cross over to such a point that when we talk about venture capital, we may not see those enormous um, organisations with huge capital behind them. We may see more faceless communal based um, venture investment. Uh, but at the minute, they're not considered to be a threat to that particular environment, partly because of their safety and legality status. So that's a bit about DAOs in terms of their concept. So hopefully that's a little bit of an unpack for you. Now, if we want to look at some of the rules of DAOs, then um, there is this sense that, oh, that what we don't need is um, a central uh, governing uh, um, uh, force, I suppose, of people who have, um, I don't know, particular sort of vested interest in something. Um, it's, it's really about encoding the rules so that the technology acts as the kind of governance feature. And that's the perhaps leap of faith that a lot of people um, might not be so comfortable with. But those that are um, playing more strongly in the DAO world, that's a real fundamental draw for them, that we have this sense that it is decentralised. It isn't owned by an individual in the way that we traditionally look at organisations and decisions, financial transactions and so on. So it's pretty much like we set the rules, we know what they are, we code them, we play that way, and it won't be that we can deviate or adjust them just because it kind of works in our favour. So, you know, you think about share buybacks in the in the real world at the moment is an attempt to uh, artificially inflate market capitalization and value. Yeah, none of that could happen in this kind of environment because it would breach the rules coded into a DAO. 
So the decentralized autonomous aspect is literally that they yeah. are not centralized on individuals and therefore there's an autonomous feel to the participation within that there. There aren't whips and agendas and, and kind of factions that are built within it. And, and so here's where DAOs kind of started, and it was the Ethereum uh, community that first got into it. So Ethereum is probably the biggest crypto exchange uh, outside of Bitcoin and probably been around even um, uh, as long, if not longer than that kind of concept. So uh, a community of people got together and wanted to create this entity that was all about funding new ventures. And so they were looking at the venture capital model and trying to create something that was decentralized, autonomous, and therefore not driven by huge characteristic egotistical figures. Um, uh, they they enrolled a team uh, from a, an organization that at the time was called Slockit, who could code in that um, particular sort of technology and could create the infrastructure for this. Um, now, Slocket is part of something called blockchains.com. So we're seeing um, a growth, if you want, of entities that are blockchain friendly coders and developers. Now, at the time, so 2016, this was biggest ever crowdfund known to um, the working world at the time, 150 million pounds, uh, euros rather, uh, dollars, was originally raised within this community. So if you want, there were people who had uh, a crypto um, uh, account uh, with Ethereum uh, as the kind of coin, and the collective value of those people who stepped into this community to create a kind of VC um, venture uh, came to about $150 million. So, you know, at the time, it was a pretty big deal. Um, one of the things I found when I was looking through DAO research is there was a group who formed a DAO and tried to buy the Denver Broncos NFL team before um, uh, Lewis Hamilton and his conglomerate bought it. They didn't win, but there was a DAO based approach to bid for the Denver Broncos. And there was a group of people who came together in a DAO to try and buy the US Constitution at the time, thinking we don't want it owned by any human individuals. We want it owned within a decentralized autonomous organization. Again, they didn't win, but it just shows you there's some existing use cases where people are trying to create the sense of something different from conventional structures, non-governmental organizations or whatever it is. Anyway, so this platform that was built through the Ethereum community as a DAO allow people to pitch projects and get funding from the DAO. Uh, and so if you have uh, tokens, you voted in it, uh, and then the beneficiary would obviously get that into the project and start to use that as capitalization to turn it into the venture, uh, turn a profit, and then um, uh, return some of the value back to those investors but it was destroyed by a hacker. So somebody at the time, either watching this close to this or whatever, used their mischievous technology skills and actually went in and hacked. And there was a, a you know kind of reports of lots of money being lost. And the confidence in this as a particular option was pretty much destroyed from the get go. And so that venture kind of proved that for, even from a good start, what appears to be good um, was still at the vagaries, perhaps of mischief and, and, and misdemeanor. So you kind of think, well, that's probably the end of the story, um, but it's not. <laughs> so I'll tell you why in, in a second. Um, but just to give you a kind of wrap up on DAOs, an internet community with a shared bank account is pretty much the best way to start thinking about DAOs. They have a kind of capitalization that is owned by individuals and they create it as a communal pot for them to then start to think about how to deploy those funds in a kind of voting mechanism so that there isn't, again, a kind of dominant force directing where that goes. And just some stats on, on Dow's activism. So the 2016 poor incident wasn't the end of this. Over, well, almost 50,000 decisions have been made through the Dow kind of infrastructure with about two and a half million votes being counted by people in as part of that ecosystem about where investment goes and how um, uh, things are taken forward and supported. And there, there are reckoned to be about 5.6 million governance token holders. So these are people who have a, a value stake in a decentralized autonomous organization to help um, uh, ventures with governance related um, decisions about investment, development, partnerships and, and, and exploration. And there's about 1.7 million people active voting inside that DAO ecosystem. So if we project out of technology, you could say 1.7 million is quite a lot of people. So probably a quite large town or, or small city in the United Kingdom, or pr probably a pretty large one actually, has about 1.7 million people. 
and they have tokens that are perhaps potentially their contributions to the commercial um, application of a government or civic service. Now, the difference between a DAO and a, a civic um, institution is there you elect members to vote who then have control of the budget and, and they, in the democratic process, kind of act on your behalf to make decisions about how much to spend on roads and schools and so on. If government of that nature was a DAO, you as a citizen would have a token and you as a citizen would be able to influence the choice about whether the potholes in your road are repaired before somebody else's because you'd have a democratic encoded process to do that. So hopefully that little um, sort of launch out into how this as an ecosystem potentially operates um, uh, could be translated into the real world uh, of now. Now, here's some pretty impressive statistics uh, about the amount of um, value in token sense, but of course there is a kind of translation out to the world of, that we occupy and with the, the monetary system that we occupy, of organisations that are DAOs and that are um, uh, capitalised in the form of cryptocurrencies. So if I just take the top one, Uniswap, that's a pretty well-known DAO. It has quite a long footprint. Um, who's the CEO of Uniswap? There isn't one. Who's the board of Uniswap? There isn't one. <laughs> because it's, it's, its only existence is driven by the fact that there are governance token holders who are in the Uniswap ecosystem who have 2.8 billion US dollars worth of capitalization in that ecosystem for other technologists and other project ventures to come to. And it isn't just technology, but largely that's where it is. Um, to use some of the, that, that um, token capitalization to create ventures and to um, build um, uh, products and services from. Now, uh, you know, I'm not going to unpack all of this, but in totality, 21 billion US dollars worth of convertible cryptocurrencies into dollar capitalization exists within the DAO system in, in and around 2022. So that's a pretty, pretty big industry kind of value. And just to give you a sense, if you compare DAOs to traditional industries, $21 billion is probably the kind of capitalization you're talking about, a market value for somebody like Kia Motors, um, Adidas Sportswear, um, some of the bigger banks in the UK are worth about $21 billion. Uh, so it's pretty big stuff, um, although still obviously super, super niche. So this is some kind of almost like exchange system, but it's just giving you the sense how many token holders there are, how many people have been in it from the get go, how many proposals are sat within this kind of infrastructure. So this is a really active world going on without any of us probably um, realising or, or dabbling into. So I found that pretty interesting. So let's get to the nub of this. Can I, well, we've got a question. Yeah, that's a quick question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I wanted to, to open up the discussion for a little bit to see does anybody yeah. have a comment? Mm. You really kind of lay this out uh, very nicely yeah. for us about you know what is a blockchain, you. how does this work, right? Without getting too technical, mm. uh, and and now yeah. we're, we're going to talk about more connecting this to to the the, the yeah. place and practices. Yeah. So before we do that, right? Any any yeah. comments or questions? Yeah, great point. She's a lot of things. She's spectacular. Yes. <laughs> Charlie, do you have a question or comment? There's one thing she's not. Uh huh. She is. Uh, well, I'll mute Charlie for that. I think you're <laughs> talking to us, but, but uh, good timing. You know? <laughs> Yay. Uh, one thing that, that oh. really struck mm. me, uh, mm. thank you for making this comparison about the size of these. Mm. Yeah. Right? So, Bigger mm. than some of the banks, right? And mm -hmm. uh, you know, the the Semco Cell Institute. We've worked with with uh, banks in Holland in the past. Mm -hmm. Right now, for example, we're we're interacting with financial institutes in the U.S. Sure. And the blockchain is something that they are, you know, actively, of course, uh, watching, yeah. observing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and we're also kind of trying to get the the hold mm. their fire to the uh, the the feet mm. to fire a little bit to say, hey. Yeah. It, yeah, you might get disrupted sooner than you think. Yeah, by these alternatives, I think so. Right, mm. and, and and maybe yeah, I think so. And so, anyways, right? Part of this is it's a new technology, just the way that that, that works financially. Mm. 
But the mm-hmm. other part is the way that the DAOs organize, right? And the way that yep. they collaborate, that, that, that's really innovative yep. and also, uh, you know, potentially competitive advantage, right? Yeah, you could, you could, I'd say right? so. Yeah, what, it, what I hear you say is, hey, there's this technology, right? So you can have a traditional organization, like a very uh, bureaucratic bank. This mm-hmm. is like, we, you know, this is in our space, so we're going to try to make yeah. this work right or the, or the fed mm-hmm. is looking into hey how do we make the blockchain work mm-hmm. for us right mm-hmm. but what mm-hmm. you're sharing is DAOs are organizations that actually embrace the technology not yeah. just from a technical point of you know yeah. products but also the way that they actually organize and, yeah. and share values yeah. share share ownership make decisions etc so yeah totally that Tell you that I suppose um, in the UK we've got this uh, constitution called a building society, which is like a financial institution that's kind of owned by its members um, who have accounts with them and deposit money with them and get mortgages from them and so on. So you know that's fairly similar. They're still they're still subject to kind of you know shareholder type board structures and decisions made by central bureaucrats and so on. So you know you might have a mortgage with a building society and have some money deposited in there. You might be able to vote certain things on you know kind of ceo remuneration perhaps if you really want to be bothered to go to their annual general meeting but actually being more active in that environment is very very difficult and hasn't been a feature of those kind of things and and cooperatives are interesting so one of the things i looked at was how are cooperatives structured when it comes to things like governance and what have you and what i found was the the kind of the infrastructure that dow set up a, a cooperative could probably port itself to the blockchain and use a dow type principle very quickly because they already have lots of checks and balances about dominant power and about shared equity and and so on so it isn't like we haven't got analog precedents for any of this but i think you're right the dow thing is probably where we wouldn't expect a bank to say oh look we've got a dow department it's like well, you can't have that because you still own it that's not in the spirit of a dow you might try and replicate some of the functions but if you still own it you could shut it down as quickly as you want to but these DAOs, if you want to shut down a dow all of your token holders have got to agree to shut down the DAO. If you want to opt out because you don't like it anymore, you just do that. So I think there's something really, really different about the longevity, the construct and the constitutional features, I think, of a DAO that we're only just starting to really compute. Yeah, cool. OK, right. The big question then, <laughs> what does it teach us? Because like I say, I'm, I'm, I'm not a cryptocurrency investor. I, I, I haven't got that kind of capitalization around. However, this has prompted me to start thinking about the form of token and the form of DAO-like principles that you could create outside of having to step into that particular field and, and water. I want to start with this, though. This is something from Gary Hamill. Um, when he spoke at Teal Around the World last year. Uh, And it kind of staggered me that what we see in conventional bureaucratic organisations of any denomination is this ridiculous burning money thing called bureaucracy. When we think about the excessive level of control and administration that we bring in because we think that's good work uh, and actually it's not it's you know you're just literally torching um, liquid assets here this is almost the case to go but surely some of these things where we've got too many layers we've got decision paths that are too long if we really really wanted to we could create more security and consistency in decision making because we could take it out of humans control and encode it in some form of dow like voting principle that doesn't mean you have to wait months to get all the votes in but the the speed of um, decision making and so on in DAOs is one of its advantages so uh, you know i think this is something we can rebel against and use DAOs potentially to debureaucratize organizations he then went on to say this In the past, human beings were resources. And I'm in the HR profession, so I've got that title, human resources. uh, And and it's like, I'm not really a fan of it. I really don't like it because it hits that top agenda, that the institution owns the individual to create income. DAOs, I think, are a way we can realise this potential new um, uh, paradigm of human beings through an institution have impact. Now, that I really, really like, not just as an economic proposition, but I think if we talk about purposeful businesses and we talk about that kind of drive to do good and matter, 
if we believe through the institution we work in we have impact that's a much nicer psychological contract and i think DAOs can potentially flip that dynamic from ownership to a participant with a stake who uses the institution's reach uh, assets uh, and and so on to achieve an impact that's congruent with why they think they're on this planet so that i really like uh, now, this is my little infographic, <laughs> tracking the world of work from uh, the 1800s industrial era right through to now, because uh, I desperately wanted to see what stages we've gone through in looking at the mechanics of work, but also the soul of work, right? So this is definitely machine and organic going on here, right? I'm not going to unpack all this because I'm sure you'll look at it and go, oh, yeah, I know that, I've, I've learned that, I've read that book, I've done this. But this tells me there's interplay all the time between mechanized and technological development, even if we talk about industrial electricity and so on. And then human beings kind of go, well, hang on a minute. This is distorting the sense of human soul and spirit and art and creativity. And there's always countermeasures and balances coming through. So that's why on this diagram, I've got the French philosopher Auguste Comte at the top. In 1851, he conducted, he was a philosopher, but he conducted some studies based on Taylorist type, mechanised industrial production. And he said, do you know what I see? I see groups of people who have a job to do. They're very tightly managed in doing that job. But I also see that when things go wrong, where people struggle, where machines break down, a different thing happens. Nobody tells them to help each other. They have a sociocratic structure of participation, support, decision making, leadership. He said, and it just happens. He said, nobody points the way necessarily. So he coined that phrase back in the day. And I love that because that was almost like the first cookie trail that says we have to take into account mechanistics and humanistics. Absolutely. When we talk about the system of work. So we go all the way through this. Of course, Ricardo burst out in the 80s and gave us a real sense of something possible. Round about the same time as Chris Roofer at Morningstar and Bill Gore uh, over at Gore-Tex where who, who said look we're just going to change it we're going to do it differently and, and reinstall that kind of human value thing and we've gone through agile and so on now I think we're starting to see the signs perhaps of where technology so long now being a kind of almost like um, addictive oppressive force potentially as well as a liberating force um, creating for us the opportunity um, to rebalance uh, and to re-establish I guess uh, a sense of um, humanity within the whole work game so that's why you've got the fictional or perhaps real Satoshi Nakato uh, Nakamoto on this um, I know you said Nakatomi then that's Die hard. Um, <laughs> Nakamoto, who apparently is the creator of the Bitcoin principle of mining and uh, uh, and so on. But nobody's ever seen him. Nobody ever knows whether he exists. It could be a pseudonym. It could be anything. But anyway, that's a statue from a, a park in Budapest, apparently. Um, yeah. Anyway, so I just thought I'd pop that up. We, we are absolutely going through this cycle again, I think, right now. Now, I know a guy from Canada called John Husband. And back in the day, he used to work for an organization called Hay. And if you're in HR, you'll know Hay because there's a Hay assessment for the pay levels that people get in jobs linked to professionalism and competence and capability. And so he was in the belly of the beast, you could say, uh, but he, he stepped out of it. And in the early 2000s, when Web2 social technology was really starting to come through, he said, I'm seeing a shift from the hierarchy to what he called the wirearchy. And I really love that phrase, and I have done ever since. So um, uh, props to John. Um, so the gaping void um, uh, uh, picture there came from that. Now, what is a wirearchy? Well, it's kind of a DAO. Uh, here's some uh, kind of outputs from John who reflected on LinkedIn literally recently saying, look, in 2001, I said, maybe we're headed to a wirearchy. And he started to put some thoughts together about what we mean by a hierarchy. And you'll see a lot of recognizable terminology here. And in fact, I love the way he unpacked monarchy, hierarchy, anarchy, patriarchy, and so on. But what he's really saying is you've got this centri centrifugal force at the moment of business strategy. But actually what we should be starting to look at now, we've got um, more interconnectedness and more opportunity to play a participative role in businesses beyond our job transaction, that we could become centripetal force and this dispersion of decision making and stretched along the value chain and so on. So I guess, I guess he was being incredibly visionary 
uh, about what he's got here. So I, there's a book that John wrote about the hierarchy. I'd recommend you go and have a look at that. But even Warren Bennis <laughs> um, actually quoted uh, as saying the hierarchy is a prosthesis of trust. So it's a kind of mystique. It's almost like, you know, it's there to give us the sense of trust when actually perhaps there, there really isn't any. And this whole sense of trust, I think, is really important to uh, Dow's. The other thing to bear in mind is uh, work of people like Ralph Stacey in organisation design who look particularly at decision making. And what he said is, look, there are different zones and there are different kind of climates that we're making decisions in. You've got rational, political, complex, as you can see here. Now, at the moment, we are grappling with what's apparently called polycrisis by the World Economic Forum, which is obviously a cluster of crises all together in one. And we've got to navigate through them. So that's in the top right corner of chaos, really. There's a lot of that going on. Now, what I think we've got to create cognitively for us is how can we do that when we're also doing all the complex, judgmental, political, rational stuff as well? We've got to, I think, outsource some of our decision making through things potentially like technology and automation safely, of course, and justly and ethically. So I think there's a kind of call in here that some of these theories early on where people go, well, I kind of get it, but you know, chaos only happens now and then. Well, I think we've got used to the fact that chaos is probably a, a pretty omnipresent situation at the moment. So to give us mental capacity and to help us realise what we should be here to do, maybe some of the complex stuff we can outsource and DAOs gives us a potential to do some of that. So as a human concept now, I just want to talk about a couple of places where I think we, we see this. As a human concept, I guess what we start thinking about is that there's a platform for decision making, for interaction, for connection. And that could be a, a, a place and it could be a technology platform. I'm not talking about it just as tech. But these things, connected, holistic, it's about optimised like decision making, speed, inclusion, participation, that they're organic, they're principled, they're democratized. I mean, these sound like a Semco style organization, really. These are the things that a Semco based organization would say, yeah, we're all those. And I think DAOs as a kind of human analog systems concept um, gives us the chance to, to, to play to that. Now, here's a DAO, I think, in human form, Björtsorg, Dutch healthcare organization, home-based care. Now, the reason I really think they are a humanist DAO is because they've got very near to not having a centralized part at all. They have a functional 56 person finance and legal compliance function of human beings, but the rest of their organization is completely decentralized. Teams of 12 nurses have voting rights on overtime and, and covering absences and how long they spend with patients and the kind of treatments that they bring them in, whether they set up a Zimmer frame Olympics, uh, which actually they did. <laughs> Now, what I love about this is that it is incredibly human, and we often um, uh, talk about Björtsorg um, very romantically because they are a really strong example of this because they're commercially viable too. Now, I want to give you some of the outputs that came from several studies on Björtsorg that I found fascinating. Patient care. If you're a Björtsorg patient, you're in hospital less than a non-Björtsorg patient. You have a longer life. You have a more social fabric around you. If you are admitted into hospital, you spend less time there. Criticality of incidents are lower. Uh, and this is all set against the, the potentially not efficient way of spending time with your patients and organising Zimmer Olympics, right? And the Beertzog nurses say, you know, let's be the judge of that when we see the, the, the results. And these are the results that matter. They're not all financial. They are human. So the outputs here are as a result of people having governance voting rights if you want they've got tokens nominally and they can do what they want because they've got this kind of belief and trust-based system operating in a human form best employer in the netherlands all sorts of brilliant things happen and, and when you do an economic study on Björtsorg against the traditional dutch healthcare system in how much it costs to run the organization kind of the same but clearly the investment here is in more of the patient front centred um, operation, not the headquarters and the bureaucrats. So I think that's why they are a humanist manifestation of a DAO. Now, this company is quite interesting because it is a blockchain organisation, BEX360. And the example I loved on this uh, is where they show you the trail of um, coffee being grown in, say, uh, Colombia or um, uh, uh, Kenya. Um, and what happens when the growers cut out all the middle bureaucrats? 
So what happens here is the people who grow coffee and it grows uh, uh, as a cherry. I didn't realize this. It's kind of like a cherry before it's then gone through the process of turning into a bean have a system that has the blockchain sat underneath it. They have a, a, a technology enabled like machine that they pour all the cherries in and it sorts out the quality cherries from the not quality cherries and it puts them out the other end. It has scanners that pick it all up. They then connect to their mobile phone and it tells them how much those coffee cherries are worth right now on the market direct to a supplier. And here's the suppliers who could take those cherries from you. And you hit your mobile phone and say, yeah, I'll have that one. You get the money instantly through a Bitcoin transaction, and then that gets sent off through the um, supply chain directly to the person who's bought that coffee from you, which might be a small coffee shop that's uh, a coffee bean processor that's based in Seattle or something. Cutting out all those middle um, uh, stages, all those kind of added value costs that are in the chain, and therefore the recipient <laughs> gets their money directly that they can then convert into um, uh, traditional currency if they need it. Now, I just find incredible, mind-blowing things. They've removed so many bureaucratic layers from it and so many corruption points because there was a lot of corruption in some of the coffee uh, trail of uh, supply. So BEX360, absolutely using the blockchain, kind of manifesting themselves as sort of partial DAO because of the sort of interaction points and the governance features that are coded in. But they're set up as a fairly traditional company, but they're a kind of social enterprise. And then um, you may have heard of this company, Inspiral. They were a consulting organization that started in New Zealand, but kind of went global, um, still going now. They had kind of three technology platforms and principles that I think are kind of Dow-esque. They had a, a code budget system where people who worked at Inspiral quite literally deposited the um, revenue from their particular work. And it was a central pot that people could draw from and draw down sort of expenses and investments and salaries and so on. They had a power uh, system for decisions called Lumio, where people, again, had democratic rights, could um, put into a, a technology platform what decisions were important to the company and, and just generally a kind of technology based handbook of contracts, I suppose. So they were a DAO. They were using digital type of technology, but not completely automated blockchain, quite traditional web two type stuff, but still with the essence of a DAO with public, shared, accountable, open trails of information and evidence. Um, still going now uh, and still operating um, in some very uh, exciting and clever areas. And so the code budget like became a product. You can buy that and put that into your inf infrastructure if you want to, which would be great for things like cooperatives and, and social enterprises and community ventures. So it exists. So how could we use it? <laughs> so I thought, hey, wow, if you're an organization of any denomination, you could say, and here's an example, uh, SSI coins, potentially, you could create an internal platform and a token system. So you could say to people who work with you, you can create some kind of internal trades. Somebody does something good for you, you can give them one of your tokens. Those tokens aren't um, capitalized outside the company but if you've got enough tokens you can ask the company to pay for a training course for you with those tokens they'll go back into the central bank of the company uh, and then they can be distributed out to other people so you could kind of create your own ecosystem with this and you could encode it with DAO like principles so people can't game it and corrupt it and so on and so forth holiday buybacks skills passports company-wide decisions uh, engagement survey content. I mean, you, you often see it, don't you? All these people who kind of say, "Oh, I've got, I've got, I've got," um, you know, to, to make a decision on something, and uh, I know that somebody else will have a say on it. But like, I've put in more effort to the company. I've created more revenue for the company, and my one vote is the same as their one vote. Surely, I should have a sort of weighting to my influential. I mean, you could do that with tokens. You could give people the chance to trade more tokens to do decisions that they feel are more important to them. So it's a way of creating value within the company. Now, as a result of this, at PTHR, we're going to try an internal DAO-like token system for internal exchange of stuff. We don't know where it will go, but we're going to have a go because there could be something really interesting about an internal ecosystem that's got nothing to do with normal capitalized finance, but is symbolic of token and value. So kind of wrapping it up, how might we help 
um, evolutionary organizations with some DAO principles. So if we've got an aspiration to rebalance, um, uh, we could we could use it as an antidote for kind of corporate hustle and, and, and all that kind of stuff by bringing in more of that de-bureaucratized, uh, automated kind of stuff so we can free people up to do that high quality work. Um, help next generation leaders understand that the dispersal of power does not mean the end of their significance uh, in some shape or form. Um, toxic cultures, we can create much more of that kind of inclusive change. Um, uh, profiteering, we might be like, well, let's, let's use this as an example of how we can create more sustainable, um, equitable wealth distribution. I think there's something really nice in that. And I'm really worried about this kind of dark ownership and private equity influence out there in the world right now. There are companies owned by people we don't know who they are and we don't know what their agenda is and all sorts of things. And I love the thought we could get more transparent with it and communal about ownership um less extractive stuff we can create stuff that isn't extractive at all blockchain and bitcoin particularly has a, a pretty strong and negative environmental footprint with all the servers power and the calculations that mine coins and then this individual and organizational health i think we've got to get something about more stimulation and and, and kind of balance into into life and so let's outsource some of the stuff that we can rely on the tech to be more um, our sort of guardian and that's it <laughs> that's it from me um so yeah I, I find the whole arena super fascinating i want to become less of an absor observer and perhaps more of an activist but hopefully that's given you some sparks and flares and marker points and, and maybe even more confusion that you want to then go out and <laughs> qualify and satisfy um but yeah hopefully we've got a bit of time for questions now well, thank you very much, Per. Let's give him a hand. This is <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, I, thank you. I really loved how you you connected it with with you know the uh, kind of the history of organizational design and all that, and then bringing it all the way back to how do we as a company uh, make use of this. So it's it's really cool to hear that, and looking forward to cool. more about how thank this you. will go. Right. So. I'd like to really open it up to all the participants here. What what are some mm. questions that you have for Perry, or maybe what are some comments or stories you would like to share? Mm. Love to know. Is anybody more confused? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Erica, thank you, thank you for that overview. It was really uh, in, enlightening. Um, and I have to say, I was doing ex an experiment while you were talking. Um, I ah. opened Chat GPT. And started Ooh. asking it questions about nice. um, about DAOs as you were talking. Mm. So uh, Ooh, it was great. really interesting to see the answers. And and I think I stumped it because it took a, a couple minutes for it to, to <laughs> even answer the first question. Um, and it, that just speaks to how little information there really is out there mm. in, in the world about yeah. this. But I asked it, yeah. What I asked it, the first question I asked was, what might DAOs teach us about alternative and evolutionary business and work practices? Lovely. And, uh, and uh, it took a while, um, and it it very much dovetailed with what you were talking about. Um, oh. <laughs> it said, uh, they have the potential to teach us about alternative and evolutionary business and work practices by providing a new model for decentralized decision-making and ownership in which all stakeholders have an equal say and share in the decision-making process. So it, it was pretty oh, basic. But then I, I later asked, I asked it several questions, like, how do you start a DAO? And it actually mm. gave me a whole bunch of steps. Um, mm. And how do you create a token system? It gave me a bunch of steps for that, too. Oh, no. Nice. But I also asked, are there examples of humanist DAOs? And, mm. uh, and so it, it gave me, um, it said a humanist DAO is a, is a decentralized autonomous organization that is guided by humanist values such as empathy, empathy compassion, and respect for human dignity. At the moment, there are not many examples of humanist DAOs in existence, as the concept is still relatively new. However, there are some projects that are working to create humanist DAOs or to incorporate humanist principles into existing DAOs. One example is the Human DAO. So mm -hmm. there's this uh, organization, and I looked it up, and it's uh, humandao.org, um, yeah. uh, which is a community-driven organization that aims to create a more equitable and decentralized future by promoting human-centered values and practices. The human DAO nice. uses a decentralized governance model and its members are able to vote on proposals and make decisions about the direction of the organization. So pretty much in line. 
And then another really? example is the Dow Stack project, which is something I've come mm. across before. Um, it's DowStack.io uh, that aims to create a platform for decentralized governance and collaboration. So I'm a technologist. I, I like to build software. And this cool. is something that really interests me, uh, the ability to empower people with software. So yeah. if you've come across anything right. like that, I'd be interested in, yeah. in spaces where people are have tools to actually build these things without having yeah. to build them from scratch. Nice. Yeah, let's keep in touch. Well, that's brilliant. I feel ever so validated by some of that. <laughs> um, uh, but equally, I think you're right, Erica. I think it shows that we're, we're, we're not not really further from the beginning of the beginning of this. I mean, really, it is just baby step stuff. Um, yet $21 billion sloshing around in that um, investment pot is is quite significant. So, um, yeah, it's one to watch, isn't it? I, I absolutely agree. I do think the civic and perhaps social enterprise side of things will cotton on to this more quickly, but will they have the confidence and capitalization to kind of get into it? So uh, I guess I'd love to think that there is a commercial social value crossover thing to come through here where some company wants to do good and says, right, instead of doing the normal thing, which is like we adopt a charity, we'll actually set up a DAO. That would be so cool because I'd love to see them step back from that, but kind of enable it, if that makes sense. So, yeah, I mean, if I'm going to lobby for DAOs in an experimental sense, that's the kind of frame I'd like like to see happen. And I think we could be also looking at things like skills passports and uh, skills transferable kind of things so that people could play a part in the DAO by going, hey, I've got these kind of qualities. What kind of DAO? would I find most appealing to that? And I think we'll we'll get technology to do some uh, almost headhunting for us on that. So that'll be an interesting thing to watch as well. But yeah, you can see it sparks <laughs> so many possibilities, right? Nice. Sure. Great. Oh, I have a awesome. question about uh, the governance tokens. Um, mm, mm. I missed out on how it's decided who has them. Is it self-selected or is it financially? base I, I missed out on that so I'd like yeah. to know about that but also if you could just talk sort of more generally about those tokens and how they, mm. how they work. yeah uh, from what I can gather so again this is me being um, a, yeah. a sort of a, an observer rather than anything uh, there's almost like an initial sign up and then then allocation into that and then it gets um into a position where there's probably enough activism to start encoding the governance rules oh, okay. so 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 i think that's what normally ha kind of happens but but i guess what what's important about that is those rules are then the way they will attract additional people to come to it so if you're making those rules and that governance kind of block too much in favor of the initial investors and people go well i'm just going to be second in the queue why would i join that so there's yeah. obviously some egalitarian stuff that comes into that mm -hmm. but it's got to start somewhere you're absolutely right, right. there's got to be a catalytic creation because the dow just doesn't pop up out of anywhere at the moment it's a human instigation thing and i've always wondered about this in terms of of um, uh, blockchains and crypto it's like yeah kind of what starts it where does it go so i think we still have to be the genesis but i think quite quickly the nature of DAOs means if you don't encode it so that there's an equal distribution of tokens and, and the inputs that, that come from that um, uh, then it's not going to go anywhere because that's kind of part of the rules that's how i understand it so then in terms of acquisition of those then i think that's where it then fractures out into some of the things that come into an ecosystem and get invested in because there will still be things that, that don't return as well as others do um i think the idea is you will potentially have um a different level of stake where it's appropriate that the support you have allows you to do that so you might be able to accelerate the funding of something if you've got more at your disposable but not to the point that you dislodge other people and you make them uh, irrelevant so i think again there's some encoding in, in that from what i've seen but those are the fascinating use cases i'd love to see which is why i want to start playing with it and see what it does inside a company yeah yeah, yeah that, that, that ver those very time. beginnings is, is interesting because there is some organization that needs to happen to allow for the non-organization exactly 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 that it's almost like you know when we talk about self-management sometimes you have to say look i'm going to inflict self-management on you you almost have to do that but that infliction means you then step away you don't have to inflict anything on anybody ever again it okay. is exactly the same frame i totally agree with you on that the genesis thing is really um, important and significant i guess one of the things we're seeing is 
the source, the founder, uh, the attachment that comes with that. I mean, I grapple with this myself. So it's like, how much of this is, is stuff about me? And how much is this stuff about it? That it becomes more important. So you then detach yourself from it. And if you're strong of um, will and, and um, emotional intelligence, you can do that. But if you're not, you get seduced by it. You don't let go and you then become a tyrant. So I think DAOs are a potential way of counteracting some of that and manifesting people who are genuinely wanting to be part of something but not have it about them all the time yeah fascinating thank you it is it really is cool Dow keeps ego separate yeah i like that i like that Dow is a kind of ego erasure <laughs> thing it's brilliant yeah yeah cool I guess there's some parallels to the employee ownership community that we, we're kind of thinking about here as well. So cooperatives and employee ownership. And I've been fascinated by that for some time, too. And, and this could be a way that we could proliferate that a little bit more. If that infrastructure is that solid as an employee, if you've got a token stake in that in that sense, we could make the whole employee ownership thing much more attractive and rapid and and, and positive. But again, that's going to be a way down the line. Hey, great. I, I want to be mindful of everyone's time, right? We said we'll, we'll go till the hour. Uh, thank you very much, Perry, for visiting us. Thank you. This was really inspiring. I hope it mm -hmm. up. I also love Erica, you know, using chat, uh, the chat uh, love that. and seeing what's going on there, right? Uh, if you all are interested in learning more about the Semcosal Institute and the expertise, there is a uh, expert program that's coming up in April 21st, right? There's information that we can share with you. And we have the next webinar that's public on February 13th. And I'll drop a, a link to this in the chat right now. This will be a really good one about, and maybe a little bit less futuristic and much more down to earth. It's how do we actually bring people back to the office in a way that's respectful of people and also in a way that's uh, also addressing the concerns that managers might have, right? Uh, and our, uh, Eliza from Bayer, she's one of our simple cell experts in the US. She's done a little bit of research and what exactly is the big issue here, right? And what are some of the root causes that underlie that, right? Because there's a big divide between what managers typically want and what employees want, right? So employees typically want to stay more at home, right? While a lot of employees enjoy spending time with others and interacting, you know, they have found some more flexibility that they'd like to preserve, right? And Semco having abolished their headquarters already in the 80s has a lot of, uh, you know, resources to how can you make this work? And how do you still can people, you know, how can we still get stuff done and work done? while making uh, work more fun for people and more flexible. Mm -hmm.